Now, usually these things are prompted. You know, you go and find somebody uh, to cross over with uh, when by a combination of restlessness and honesty, uh, you're dissatisfied with a bypass. In other words, there's a certain dogma and there's a certain observation and they miss in midair. You have a bypass situation and 99% of people say, well, yeah, we just don't know. Nobody knows. Uh, but the restless people, energetic people, honest people, and, and Gary's one and Randy's another, just won't let those bypasses go. You know, they, they just can't sleep at night with the bypass. Okay, uh, the dogma said this should have happened with this patient and this didn't happen. Right? So basically, you just get restless. And you're honest enough to, uh, to realize that uh, you, the answer to this, everything's very unsatisfactory. The, the journal clubs are generally exercises in collective uh, ignorance. That is, they, they speak the language, they, they say the words, but when it really comes to the numbers, they don't understand what the numbers are telling them. They understand the biology, they understand the clinical part, they understand the, um, uh, every, all, all the, 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 the qualitative dimensions very well. But they don't know how to marry that with the numbers. They don't have a really fine sense of, you know, I know this, uh, you know, from my clinical experience. I know this from the clinical trials. They they don't, in some sense, really have a finely graded sense of the weight of the evidence that they're getting from the research together. And this is where we have real problems in 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 the medical field: is that we we don't, at some level, know how to read our own literature. And observational data fundamentally will not get you there. Because no matter essentially what observational data you show me, I can come up with an alternative explanation for those data that explain the study. I'm not saying the studies are wrong. That would lead to a different conclusion regarding what you should do interventionally to achieve the best possible outcome for that patient. with either uh, uh, getting the lucency smaller or resolution, mm -hmm. then, uh, then doesn't that mean that we have improved uh, the situation? Uh, I would buy that if you think that radiolucency is what we call a perfect surrogate of the clinical outcome. And I know no medical discipline that has perfect surrogates of the clinical outcome. A perfect surrogate is not just a strong correlate of the outcome, which means a strong risk factor. It's also a strong correlate of the treatment response, which means that every single patient who has reduced radiolucency will do great. And every single patient who does not have reduced radiolucency will do bad. Do you have that? I mean, if you have that, then this is the first time that I see a perfect surrogate, and, and I can take it and, and say that then, then you have an answer. You don't need randomization. Instead of looking at other outcomes, you just look at radiolucency. And uh, Gary likes people to agree with him. He gets kind of ugly if you don't agree with him, actually. And his, his point about uh, starvation and biofilms is absolutely classic because that's one of the reasons that biofilms formed in the first case was that biofilms are resistant to drying, which is really important in marine environments. And what happens in a biofilm is if one bug dies, then its guts just to first disperse over and the next bug soak it all up and usually divide. So biofilms are immortal. I can keep a biofilm in the lab for a couple of weeks and say, oh, gotta feed my biofilms and give them a little dash of, of whatever and leave them for another month. That's exactly what biofilms do. They don't starve. And we're now using biofilms as barriers in engineering. We're placing huge biofilms in sand and, and the subsurface in soils and so on. And we have to feed them about once every 163 years by our calculation, Gary. <laughs> so your, uh, your argument is a slam dunk. Uh, nutrients have got nothing to do with a biofilm once it's formed. They've got a lot to do with how big a biofilm gets formed. But once it's formed, once the biofilm is formed, have nothing to do uh, about feeding the organisms.
One of the challenges that you all seem to have is how to interpret data that are gathered in roughly this idea. We have a large practice, it seems to be often done with graduate students, um, and, and we enroll everybody, we collect all kinds of data about their baseline characteristics, what treatment was given, which we didn't really control, what happened, like that perforation thing and the, what was the, the, the flap or inflammation, what did you call it? Flare up. The flare up thing. Okay, and then some, some outcome, and let's just assume it's tooth survival so we don't have to have another argument over radiographic findings. Okay? And you have all these variables, and, the, and you want to ask the question, how important, and this is an observational study, and you want to, just for prognostication, you want to answer the question, how important is each of these variables, meaning if the patient smokes, should I tell them that that raises the risk of failure or you know, death of the tooth by some amount, okay? And there's two things, there's two comments I wanna make, or two general com concepts. One is the difference between prediction and variable selection, and the other is collinearity. So hopefully I will remember those both, okay. When you do a regression model, a regression model basically asks the question, how much do these ind independent variables affect the likelihood of the dependent variable, which we're gonna use as our example is the dichotomous outcome of tooth survival. And you have a long list of predictor independent variables, okay? The way these studies are generally done they have a table at the end, and boy, you guys bury them 20 or 30 pages in. You guys have the most verbose literature I have ever read, okay? Where you have a table where you list the variables that survive through some complicated model building strategy. Usually something like, we screened each of the variables independently to see if it was associated with outcome. Those that were associated with outcome with some particular p-value, we put in a multivariable model. Then in, in the multivariable model, if they still looked good, we kept them. If they didn't look good anymore, we dropped them out. And we would, did this through several stages until we had our 12 predictors of outcome or 13 predictors of outcome. Does this sound familiar? You, I don't know if you guys think. Okay. Because I've just, I did, that was about 20 pages I just did right there, okay? Okay. And in, when you look at that table, there's two pieces of information a clinician might take from it. One is, what are the variables that are important? That's called variable selection or identification of the predictors. The other is how important are they? So those would be the odds ratio measures for how much does having one of these predictors of a bad outcome increase the chance of tooth failure, tooth death, okay? Unfortunately, aggression, a regression model is fundamentally aimed at answering neither of those questions a regression model is a way of doing prediction, which is saying if you had a new patient in whom you had measured these 13 variables, can you predict what their probability is of five-year tooth survival or four-year tooth survival, whatever it is? That's what a regression model does. So the techniques that are used in at least the papers I looked at where you do this screening of multiple variables and let the data decide which ones survive till that last table in the manuscript is highly unreliable. And what I mean by unreliable, I mean this in a very rigid sense. What I mean is if you did the exact same study again, you use the same inclusion exclusion, the same graduate students, just different set of patients, and you did the whole thing and you went through that whole model building strategy, the chance that you would get the same list of predictors is very, very close to zero. It's unreliable, meaning you can do the same thing more than once and have a different result, unlike the car that's reliable, okay? So I place virtually no stock in the specific identification of the predictive variables. Now, why is that? Well, this is a consequence of the process of making discoveries based on some statistical rules. It's a, it's a side effect of statistics, in a sense, a collateral damage of uh, using p-values to identify significant effects or treatments or, or risk factors. You can't really know one without the other. Even if that's all you're gonna do in your scientific paper, you have to know both. And when I say no, 
I mean that you have to have the same amount of evidence for both. A very common problem of people trying to do research and report sensitivity and specificity is that they take a, a sample of interest and they, they go to a great deal of trouble getting a good gold standard and they find out at the end of it that 95% um, of uh, the cases that they studied had the disease. Well, that's, um, that's really good from the point of view of specifying what sensitivity is. It gives you a very narrow confidence interval, the space where you're confident that the value lies within. Problem is, if it turns out that you only have you know, five or six patients who didn't have the disease that allows you to say what um, specificity is, then it can range anywhere across the ROC space. Your confidence interval is very wide. So what that means is that your value of sensitivity, so very carefully specified, can lie anywhere along the axis of uh, specificity. So you basically don't know what you got. This is a formula for how you respond to evidence. So in a, in a sense, this is a formula for science. This is saying, you can start wherever you want. You know, start wherever you want. You can say this is a cockamamie theory, this is a probable theory, but you gotta respond to data in a coherent way. And you can show, theoretically, formulaically, and that if you don't obey this rule, that you will always end up being caught in incoherent beliefs. That you will, you will say things like, um, this treatment is better than that treatment, A is better than B, and B is better than C, and C is better than A. Or you could simultaneously come to the conclusion that C is better than A, and A is better than C. That is, the probabilities of being uh, one better than the other is, adds up to more than one. I mean, all sorts of crazy stuff. So if you don't, you can show that if you don't modify your beliefs in this way, any other way of modifying your beliefs ends up with crazy beliefs. The way you would do that is you wouldn't let your data pick the variables. You would use what you know about the biology and what you've observed in your clinical practice to identify the list of likely predictors. And I would want you to come up with probably five to eight. Five if you could do it without hurting each other. Okay. The reason for that is inherently Bayesian. It's because I want a set of predictor variables that I know have a high enough pretest probability, pre-study probability, prior probability, of being the right ones because you know, they make sense, they, they match your clinical experience, et cetera. Then I'm going to be using the data from the trial and the regression fit using those as the predictors to estimate the magnitude of their association. That is a coherent method of model building because I've separated the prior information, which is in the list of variables you give me, from the likelihood function, which is the data, which then gives me the regression coefficients that tells me which variables really are important and how important are they. Okay? The model building strategy where you let the data do everything in this ill-defined way mingles the prior information and the current likelihood in a way that gives the data such sway over the variables that the variable selection, the, the details of what you ended up with, not you personally, but what the authors ended up with, is likely reflects the noise in the data as well as the actual information that were there. Okay. So there's this whole set of observational data that you seem to be enamored of in your specialty that I have grave concerns about. And the alternative is to actually try things that, and the selection of what you try should be informed by the models that you have or the uncertainty you have in those models and actually see what happens and do randomized control trials. And I think that if you don't change your mode of doing research to doing randomized trials with good long-term follow-up, that you could invite me back in five years and like our esteemed host, I could just hit play a tape of my talk this time and it would still apply. I think you're going to have to do that to break out of this mold. Gary was saying, we as microbiologists, and particularly microbiologists who study infectious disease, we all owe an enormous debt 
um, to Robert Koch. And his paradigms were developed to explain what were the prevailing um, infectious diseases of the time. These were acute clonal epidemic diseases that would run through populations and kill very large segments of the population. And the system that he came up with very accurately modeled what was going on in these acute infections. And so the idea, you know, of, of isolating, you know, a, a single bacterial isolate, putting it in culture, taking it out, putting it in an experimental animal, showing it it caused the same disease, and then re-isolating it was a very valid and uh, paradigm, and it still is, if you're dealing with acute clonal infections. What I really want to stress today is that there is a fundamental difference um, between acute infections and chronic infections, um, and Koch's postulates don't apply to chronic infections. So there is this very important dichotomy between chronic and acute infections. And you'll see me over and over again in the talk today, I'll be referring to some of our work where we study middle ear disease or otitis media. And this is a, a very useful um, dichotomous model um, because there, are, there is an acute form of otitis media and a chronic form of otitis media. And recently I have learned from talking with uh, Gary and his colleagues that this is not unlike uh, what you see in dentistry, that you also have this dichotomy of acute and, and chronic disease. So this brings us to the distributed genome hypothesis. And the distributed genome hypothesis says that chronic bacterial pathogens utilize a survival strategy wherein a majority of their genes are distributed among a population and are not found in all members of the species. Thus, at the population level, there exists a supergenome, which is much greater in size than the genome of any one organism for that species. This idea that your value to the patients and the value of your specialty to your patients needs to be based on things that patients can perceive as being an expected benefit of the therapy if it's successful. You should be worried if you continually have studies that show that you make x-rays look better but the teeth fall out just as much or hurt just as much. I'm not saying they do, but I'm just saying you should be worried. So you instead should design your future studies so that the primary outcomes are things that the patients care about, people are willing to pay for in terms of the, the benefit, and these things that help you understand baseline risk or the process of disease that leads to those outcomes as a scientific endeavor, those are things you should continue to collect, but don't confuse them with outcomes. Back at Red, Naaman and Pearson's original papers, Naaman's papers subsequently, which I did and had to. I was one of, among the cohorts of his la the last students taking his class on his research project and so forth. No, that, this is exactly the philosophy that was driving him. That you could never prove anything. You could only disprove it. You could only leave it standing within the current margins of error so that it might still be viewed as useful. And that got lost somewhere along the way in basic stat teaching and even advanced statistics teaching. Reason you cannot use the fact that, that symptomatic teeth tend to have lesions and therefore and I should intervene when an asymptomatic tooth has a lesion is because you have no idea what the denominator is of teeth with lesions who remain asymptomatic for the entire life of the patient. You have no idea. You also have the chance of not having any symptoms doing a procedure and then you have symptoms. Because of yeah, because of the procedure, exactly. So, so, I mean, so far we haven't discussed the possibility of the procedure causing problems on its own. So, so you wouldn't uh, know anything about that, would you? <laughs> well, uh, based on my personal experience, I, I had an endodontic procedure so that I wouldn't have a problem. And then I had a problem. I, I, my, my tooth broke within a couple of months. Uh, and, you know, I had the non-problem for several years. Uh, so. so, collinearity is the tendency of two different predictive variables to be correlated with each other, okay? So let me take, uh, do a classic one. Let's do smoking and, and excessive alcohol use, okay? So just out of curiosity, is alcohol use something you guys, um, that affects dental health? It does, right? 
No, not your social life. Does it affect dental health? Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's interesting. So it's not a huge issue. Well, I'm going to use it as an example because I, I know the correlation for it. Okay. So what is, the, what is the smoking behavior of patients who self-identify as alcoholic? They generally smoke. What is the drinking of behavior of people who smoke? They're, they're not, it doesn't mean they're alcoholic, but they do generally drink. Okay, so there's a correlation between the two. So what happens if you include both smoking and drinking in a predictive model of, let's just do a general health, okay, because clearly you, bo you believe the effect, okay? What do you think happens? So the question is, you do a regression model, your predictors are, do you drink, do you smoke, and the outcome is, is you know, some measure of health, One exercise. Also. Yeah, you and I talked in the break. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So the answer was one hides the other. They steal the effect of each other because they are correlated. They are collinear. They measure the same thing. If you like, they're both, you know, at the risk of being overly judgmental, they're both poor lifestyle decisions. Of course, I ate bacon at breakfast and then I ate a hamburger at lunch, so, okay. But those are also poor lifestyle decisions, right? Okay, so they're correlated with each other, so they're measuring kind of the same characteristic. It's kind of okay because you can look for an interaction of the two, maybe you think of them as independent decisions, but let me show you where this is a real problem. So, when you have a predictive model in your papers that have baseline, true baseline characteristics, and you have other predictive variables in your model that are therapeutic misadventures or poor proximate outcomes. Now your estimates get completely confused. So if, for example, let's suppose that diabetes is a risk factor for a poor outcome and it's a risk factor for having a flare-up, okay? If your regression model shows a positive odds ratio, you know, a, a, a non-one odds ratio, you know, a two, say, for diabetes, and a two for if a flare-up occurs, if you take the flare-up out of the model, the, the regression coefficient for diabetes is going to get even larger because now the effect of the flare-up is captured in the diabetes because the diabetes is a risk factor for the flare-up. Okay? Now why is this important? It's important because when you are trying to, S, you're trying to risk stratify your patients and you're trying to tell them, because you have diabetes, I need to warn you that your risk of a bad outcome changes by X amount. If the model included the flare up in it, which is an outcome, not a predictor, the X that you tell them is wrong. You haven't told them the effect of diabetes. You've told them the effect of diabetes somehow removing the effect of diabetes causing a flare-up. And yet that's part of what the diabetes is doing if they're correlated. It's increasing the risk of a flare-up. I assume a flare-up is an infectious complication. Okay, so presumably diabetes doesn't... Okay, okay, you guys can't agree on that. So, um, uh, okay. So d does that make... This is really important. So when you confuse baseline predictors with proximate outcomes and you put them all and you act as if they're all predictors in your model, they steal each other's effect, give you the wrong results for the real baseline predictors and you get quantitatively the wrong answer in saying what the effect is on the likelihood of the outcome you really care about like tooth survival or radiolog radiologic clearing. Okay. So that's called collinearity because of the fact that those two predictors tend to go with each other and therefore confuse each other. So when you're reading your literature, and if you're involved in design, discussions about design, please pay particular attention to having the predictors be things that are true predictors. Now, Gary made the comment that you will be in a position where your patient comes back and they've had a flare-up. And you want to be able to tell them, what does that tell, tell you about that individual patient's long-term chance for a good outcome in terms of tooth survival? To do that model, 
you have to take, uh, you have to have in the model just the flare up and the other th characteristics of the patient at that point in time, not their baseline stuff. Okay? Because now they're at a different point and the model needs to be based at patients who get to that point. Okay? It's a different model. Okay? Maybe the same, it may be a subset of the patients, right? Because some of those patients never got to that point. And it has ones that did have a flare up and didn't, but it's everybody who came back at that point. Does that make sense? You want the model to be based on the population at the same point in care about which you're making inferences. Okay. Even if every study was a perfect randomized trial, I, could, I would bet you that we would still find ourselves with lots of big problems because of the difficulty that humans have in interpreting data, even from perfect studies. Okay. I do think that doctors, all clinicians in general, have to be very humble about what they think they know in terms of outcomes. And, and that's been the biggest problem, is that uh, every caregiver often thinks they know better how to treat a collection of people. But when subject to actual clinical trials, often that intuition is not borne out. So to know when to take the clinical trial result and when to contravene that result in a particular case is a very, very tricky area. I, uh, maybe it'll come up more as I talk. Um, it, it almost doesn't, you can't, you almost can't talk about it in the abstract. You have to talk about particular cases because it very much has to do with how well you understand the, pro the, the processes from beginning to end in a particular patient. Usually there's a gap. Usually you can predict very well, you know, two days hence, but you really can't predict out here. And that's what the clinical trial does. It goes from here to here. It says, we give this therapy today, you know, one year later, this is the outcome. But there's a lot of stuff in the middle it may leave out. Now, if you think you have a lot of intuition about <laughs> that stuff in the middle, maybe you do and maybe you don't. And maybe it doesn't make a difference. A lot of the things that we think we know, we might be right, but it doesn't make a difference. So. Okay, how about for this? Why is it that you guys have studies that look at this, ap this apical radiographic changes as an outcome? Okay, so it's a proxy for success. It's correlated with pain. And by that stage, we change our whole profession. So that would be the ideal. So who are we treating? <laughs> you have to know that this, this um, Psychical, psychological need to have personal effectiveness, independent of what's perceived by the patient, is shared by all healthcare professions. Okay? I can come up with lots of examples where in, in my particular specialty, we did the same thing for years. And, and some people only gave up the outcome measures they cared about when they died. The, the physician died. Okay? Okay? Now, if, if you read the methodological literature, uh, to get strong evidence of surrogacy, you need two prerequisites. One, you need to have randomized evidence. So you cannot have a strong surrogate unless you have already run a randomized trial that had shown that what radiolucency evolution told us is exactly also what we saw in the clinical outcome. Number two, you need a large treatment effect. So you, you need a randomized trial that shows a large clinical benefit, and then you can take whatever candidate surrogate marker, map it uh, along with that benefit, and see that it does map and concord very nicely with the clinical benefit. In, in this case, there's no randomized trial, let alone treatment effect. So, uh, you know, it, it would be completely a, a belief that, you know, radiolucency is such a great marker. You know, ultimately this takes, you know, a long time and immersion and, and careful thinking.